Dennis Hill, I'm the president of Exacta Corporation, the creators of uh, Corporate Organizer, CRM and more, and Family Organizer Plus, this year's Personal Technology Award winner from the Business Journal's uh, publication. I'm going to speak today about integrating for growth, and I have several slides to go through. Um, we're hoping that this would be more of a conversation. So if you have questions, feel free to put them into the chat box or simply barge in on the conversation. That's fine. It is a conversation. Um, and um, if you have uh, some things to contribute other than questions, feel free to do so. This is an open forum for the next uh, 30 minutes. So uh, the discussion is around integration and integration of particularly particularly systems and software um, as the infrastructure, but it could be any kind of integration for a business. Uh, the idea being that companies traditionally have three ways of maintaining order, right? They have um, a uh, manual or an island approach where people just kind of keep their own data, uh, segmented away from everything else, um, share it as they need to, but most of those processes are, you know, dependent upon an individual and their particular level of effort. Uh, we also have a concept of interfaces and bridges, uh, where we have maybe two applications that need to share data, and so we build these little bridges between them uh, so that we don't have to necessarily replicate the data manually, but somehow the data is replicated. For example, customer information that's stored in a CRM or contact relationship manager is also stored over in the accounting system. And so those two applications become two very distinct sets of information and you have to build a bridge between them to keep them connected. While those bridges break, um, they're often problematic in that they offer um, an integration um, uh, opportunity because they are just simply interfaces. And those interfaces themselves are like tectonic plates um, on the surface of the earth. That's where you know we call these interfaces faults. And because of the rubbing and the grinding between them, uh, we see earthquakes. Well, that's the same thing is true in data management systems that are built around non-integrated software, but they have to talk to each other. So you get these interfaces and sometimes they build these little bridges between them. Sometimes they try to work well together, but in most cases they become a very disruptive force in the organization or in the company uh, because they get out of sequence or they get out of lockstep with one another. In either case, the problem is that in most interfaced or bridge data, it's replicated. So if you're not maintaining both systems, either through an automated or manual process, it's very easy, for example, for the accounting department who has to get invoices out to have a completely different address than, say, the salespeople and their CRM, uh, especially if the company has moved or relocated. Uh, that, that's a problem because we have to know where our invoices are going. We have to know that they're getting there. Um, and so as soon as the salespeople know that change or the customer support people know that change, those two sets of information have to be updated. And so we can see a whole lot of inefficiency added to that process of having to maintain that interface. Hi, Jackie. How are you? I'm good, Dennis. Sorry, I was late. Good, good to see you. Thanks for joining in. This is open conversation. I got started in case we, we, uh, we were, you know, we're recording this too for posterity. And uh, we're hoping that if there's some questions or issues, people could come up. I'm only on the second point here of methods of data. The first being manual and, and island, where people maintain their own information and generally share it or give it to people largely in a, you know, it can be an electronic format, like a spreadsheet or something like that or just manual people hand out pieces of paper, but it's, it has its own, has its own issues, right? Uh, hi, Jamie, good to see you. You're muted, which is fine, but chime in if you'd like. 
Hey, Dr. Hill, great to see you. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you. This is wonderful. I've, I've started, but I think you'll catch up pretty fast, right? So um, I've been talking about manual uh, islands of information and have just completed talking about what interfaces are, right? Like tectonic plates, two things rubbing up against each other, two things having a need to replicate the data, and those can get out of step. And when that happens, you have disruptive forces in the business. So, you know, I was using the example of customers and um, their addresses. And we've always said, hey, we have to let accounting know because we need to know that those invoices are getting there. And sometimes that'll get out of sync with what the salespeople are using in their CRM solution, if they have one. But the beauty of, of the third benefit is integration. So integration is neither an island, nor is it two, two or more interfaces with bridges, but an actual way for the software to work together in a seamless fashion, in a seamless fashion. And there are tools out there right now that allow you to do that. Uh, and, and, and they're gonna continue to populate and grow. This, this idea of integration is not a new concept. I've been talking about it since about the 1980s that it's important that our accounting, for example, in our manufacturing processes and our distribution process, our time and attendance for payroll, all work together seamlessly. But we still have issues today, don't we? Um, and so identifying those strategic opportunities to integrate information will have a, a, a plethora of benefits to a company at some point, uh, some of them quite immediate, some of them much longer term. So integration is where the software works seamlessly with one another. And what's really interesting there is when the software is working seamlessly, the people are working seamlessly. And I think that's the real problem in systems. It's typically um, user frustration over having access to information and that that secondarily is actually accurate information. So we're gonna define a completely new way of thinking about end users and information. The World Economic Forum uh, has documented a, a series of industrial revolutionary periods. They claim that we're in the fourth industrial revolution where we're really knowledge people, we're knowledge managers, we're decision makers. That thought process, along with the pandemic in the past year, have really hit home on uh, new ways of living and working. I don't think anybody in the world has been unaffected by this. And the notion of working from home has rapidly caught on simply because you couldn't go to work. And, and of course, there were ramifications in the personal service delivery businesses like restaurants and things like that. But at the end of the day, when we're looking at people who are white collar workers or information workers, that sort of thing, um, that migration to remote work or work from home or work from anywhere uh, has really taken on new meaning prompted by the pandemic and everything that that, that that forced. I don't think there was any doubt that the gig economy as it was emerging over the last, oh, well, say, two decades uh, was resulting in more and more work being done less and less in the workplace. Uh, software, for example, has, as an industry, grown tremendously, but largely uh, in a cost-effective way with a lot of offshore work being done in India and China and South America. That hasn't changed. And that won't change. But those tools and techniques that were developed to manage those remote, remote workforces were quickly adapted in the past year by a lot of organizations regardless of size. A lot of small businesses continue to function with um, by adapting and uh, technology that allowed remote working. But here's what's pretty apparent to me in this is that the reference to quote computer users is almost an offensive term. I find it offensive. And I think in the social dilemma movie that came out on Netflix last year, if you haven't seen it, I have to highly recommend it and find some way if, you, if your kid has has a Netflix subscription, say, hey, I want to sit down and watch this movie, or you, or you have a, a subscription to Netflix. What a wonderful, wonderful picture of what big tech and social media is doing in terms of 
um, influencing people's thought processes, even in a Pavlovian way, kind of conditioning people to be very present with their face on their phones and their tablets and things. But they make one point in there. Only drug dealers and computer people refer to their to, to, to folks as users. And I thought that was very interesting. It, it really hit home for me because one of the things that we have to think about in terms of information and data and why this is an important consideration when we're talking about integration is because in this world, we have those who own the data and we have those who gather the data. And, and, and so information owners and gatherers, those responsibilities have kind of overlapped at times and blurred the lines because we, we didn't want to impose processes or software on people who were data gatherers if it would somehow upset the apple cart. And yet at the same time, the owners in doing so shirk their responsibilities for issues like security, integrity, governance, risk minimization, and things like that. And as small business owners, we have to be concerned about those things because our computer systems are just as susceptible to hacking as large enterprises. So we need to think in terms of who is the owner of the data within my business and who is the gatherer of the data, data in my business and how can we work together to streamline our processes and build on a solution for information management that really can scale and grow with us as we uh, move down the road with our successful enterprise. So typical business applications, this is old school for I'm sure people like Jackie in the accounting industry and others that uh, these are the typical applications that most businesses contend with. Small businesses, pardon me. Small businesses uh, obviously are concerned with going out and, and getting um, either an accountant who can do the accounting electronically, if they're, uh, I have friends that just opened up a, a bar grill up in the Upper Peninsula, and the last thing they want to do is be sitting on a computer putting stuff into a QuickBooks. They did that for the last 15, 20 years of having their regular business, and this is kind of a retirement thing. So they did find an accounting firm that will do all of the electronic accounting for them. Um, because at the end of the day, as, a, as an owner, even of the data, because uh, they're the ones who are responsible to make sure things like financial statements and so forth are correct, at the end of the day, as owners, they don't need to be transactional. They just need to know that the processes are set up so that the data gatherers are doing their work. Uh, and so in our typical business applications, we see what I would call the core accounting and related areas of the general ledger for financial statements, receivables, which may or may not include order entry, but at the minimum, it does include invoicing and receiving of payment. And then payables, which of course is largely bills and payments, but could also include purchasing and maybe even a more complicated distribution and manufacturing operations inventory. All of these things impact ultimately that top area here of financial reporting and then payroll with the wages, taxes, deductions, benefits, time, and attendance. I, I think, is that is that pretty typical, Jackie, of, of what you see in, in most of your clients? Yes. And, and do they tend to have like a separate and distinct payroll solution to what they do as opposed to their core accounting? They do, they're both separated. I mean, yeah. even in our, even in our accounting firm, we have a payroll department and we have a bookkeeping department. So, and yeah. we have different people in charge of both of those. And that's and that's uh, very typical of where we've evolved and come from. But again, you if you look at how are we getting the data from payroll to post to those accounts in the general ledger, somebody or something, maybe it's an application that links those together, has to be done. And so what you have is right there, a living example of, Unless, they're, unless the software is produced like, say, QuickBooks, where you've got your accounting and payroll as separate features of the same accounting package, they can be islands, right? The, a lot of small businesses particularly will use paychecks or something like that, an outside service. They, they get spreadsheets and they can import the summary numbers. But if it got into any detailed reporting, say, on, on actual detailed labor costs or you wanted to get into job or project costing, 
uh, you would you would pull your hair out in trying to reconcile two different systems for that reporting purpose. Then, of course, other applications over here, which we take for granted, is like our, our office solutions for documents, spreadsheets, presentations. Some companies at a particular size may or may not be using contact relationship tools for uh, working with um, uh, sales prospects, but it can be used for other, other areas too. Workforce recruitment. Um, applications you know looking for new hires this is really going through a lot of change especially in light of the the pandemic and a lot of changes forced on a lot of people and a lot of companies over the last year many don't even have an hris their their human resource information system is a folder with all of the paper documents in it things like that and so compiling a paper trail efficiently for say an unemployment hearing or an OSHA requirement meeting or something like that, it becomes a nightmare. In any case, workforce management is usually an add-on. Facilities management, which deals with the maintenance, security, infrastructure. I, I would even, in many cases, recommend companies to consider just putting their IT people underneath infrastructure. Historically, it's come under finance or, you know, in a separate area, but it's grown out of finance over the years because that was the core business application. But I think it's more infrastructural than it's ever been. How do we handle people working remotely, things like that? It's much broader than just the accounting functions. And, and yet a lot of companies really haven't thought about it that way. So you still see a lot of IT coming up through the, well, they may have a senior level officer in charge, but most of them don't. And then some really uh, more um, ubiquitous or unique kinds of things like dealer and vendor management. For example, um, uh, one of our longest serving consultants actually designed, developed, and still maintains to this day since 1980, the dealer management system globally for international harvester um, case, case IH. And uh, that that is just, a whole world unto itself. How, how do you get these dealers to manage consigned inventory and how do you track that? And how do you finance that The floor planning that's involved in co-op advertising? And the other side is vendor management. Most big organizations from the state of Wisconsin to the, the Kimberly Clarks, the U.S. banks and so forth, they use uh, processes in the area of vendor management, which try to reduce costs by having a better process to manage people. So these are what I would say probably represent about 95% of the kinds of typical applications you would see in a business today. Uh, bringing that issue home to the idea of, um, of information owners and gatherers, the owners ultimately are the people who have to sign the bottom line on contracts, documents, tax filings, and things like that. These are our C-suite folks that are responsible really for the company level activity. Ultimately at the bottom line of that is governance. Somebody has to have the responsibility. They're the ones that have to report an audit. They're the ones that have to report in uh, administrative hearings on unemployment or EEOC claims or whatever. Um, and then of course we have uh, what I call the, those are the C-suite, the CEOs, the COOs, the CFOs, the CIOs, the CHROs, the, the C everythings that are out there. And then you have your D-suite people. These are your directors, your managers that are overseeing the operations of particular areas each day. I'm giving an example here of the differentiation say between the finance director and the sales director. And underneath them, they have a variety of information that's managed by gatherers who are responsible for the acquisition and man maintenance of information as opposed to the security and integrity of decision processes involving information. And these workers are responsible for making sure that orders get in, that, it, and, and that invoices are generated, and that receipts are processed. The interesting thing here is I put this up here because it is one area where you often see salespeople insisting on having access to financial information. And in small businesses, that means giving them access to your accounting system, which is probably not a good governance thing, right? It's not governance, it opens up the room. And frankly, 
uh, if people aren't really on top of what areas of their software are, are able to be secured from uh, casual viewing as opposed to actually need to know viewing, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to have that. And of course, it adds to the licensing for software, things like that. On the other hand, they do need to have access to the orders. Finance, they really don't care about the orders. They really only care what's actually going to be invoiced and received. But that does give them an advanced plan on knowing exactly what's coming down the pike. And so while it's a soft number from a financial point of view, it's still a pretty good leading indicator of what's going to happen for them in the management of their invoices and receipts. So in most companies today, sales and orders are a separate process, a separate island, a separate system in many cases than finance, the accounting, and rightly so. But what if they could be integrated? What if they could share only that information, which in fact they need to have access to? Finance doesn't really particularly care about who the salespeople are calling on or what they're calling on, but they do care about what orders are actually coming in the queue. And salespeople would like to know that if they're calling on a customer or plan to, are they behind in their payments? You know, the worst thing to do is to try to call a client and not know, or a customer, and not know that, that they are, you know, an average of 90 days, 120 days, or even if that trend is continuing more company-wide. I, mean, I saw a lot, I think we all have in the past year, where companies slowed down and the whole payment process slowed down. People took longer to make pay. Um, and of course, companies that have very rigid late payment and, and interest policies had to revisit all of those. Um, and that's not just in the conventional sense that I'm talking about. Landlords have to forgive a certain period of time, for example, on rents to be paid and, and there's a moratorium on evictions. All sorts of things pandemic had an impact on. So this is just one glaring example of where owners and gatherers differentiate. And I think at the end of the day, the owners are really responsible for the security and integrity of a decision process involving information. And in small businesses, they're also the ones in many cases roll up their sleeves and will put data in, in which case they really do need more automation than what they've got. Uh, gatherers, they're responsible for the accurate acquisition and maintenance of the information. And, and it's very important to note the difference because there's a lot of people who are gatherers who don't realize that their job is accurate, accurate, accurate acquisition and maintenance of that information. And if we thought about it in this sense, that we're all kind of users of technology, but we think in terms of data ownership versus data gathering, this will have ramifications on even the personal security issues that we're seeing come up um, with respect to the COVID vaccination certificate and other things. Who owns the data matters? I'll give you an example. In human resources, we have employees. Some human resource departments are responsible for the contractors. Uh, primarily, we are concerned with payroll and benefits, but we might also be concerned with employee development and training, performance measurements, other things. But human resources is also the finder of new, new talent. And so what we have out here are applicants, a completely different group of people who are really not legally members of that company's employee base. They're not, they're, they're outside parties and their data their application data, their name, address, social security number, everything that they've provided in an online or a physical application really belongs to them. Now, we have not seen that law passed universally in the United States, but elements of it are present in the new California Consumer Privacy Act that went into effect a year ago, January. And it is also part of the general data protection regulation in the EU or what's called GDPR that kind of took the, took the world by storm about four or five years ago as people were told, companies were told, upgrade your websites, 
be aware that people need to be able to opt into, not out of your website. That's very different than the human experience on the web here in the United States. We're assumed to be opted in. You opt out. But everywhere else, especially in Europe, it's opt in. You don't have a right to just take my data and start bombarding me with junk mail. Uh, so that's a significant change uh, that that is coming to the United States. Uh, there's partnerships that uh, called the, for example, the U.S. A privacy Shield Agreement with the EU, which was nullified last year for uh, some technical reasons. Uh, that that ensures that the data that's coming across or being shared across borders is shared responsibly uh, with appropriate levels of security. And at the bottom line, the, bo the, the real premise of this, the foundational belief is the idea that the individual owns their data. So even though that information is on an application that they have submitted to the company, the time has come in many parts of the world and is coming here to the United States, beginning in California, to recognize that your data belongs to you as an individual. And that credit card application you filled out 15, 20 years ago that was on a data that was on a computer system that had a data breach is actually your data. You had a right to know that they kept it. You had a right to ask for it to be purged. And those laws are now emerging with some vigor. What does that mean for us? That means that as we're integrating systems, we need to be knowledgeable of the fact that some of the data that we have gathered as businesses, not just as transactional workers, is not data that we own. That's why I distinguish between owners and gatherers. Because within the company, there are owners and gatherers. But even with respect to the people that we work with, our customers, our vendors, future employees, namely applicants, they are the owners of their data, even though it may reside in our systems. So this will have great ramifications as we go forward. Now, document uh, is a big issue. I have to tell you that just to create a document and file it is about $20 according to the Records Management Association. But that can get as high as over $250 if you lose a file and have to completely reconstruct it. When you think about that, records management document control is one of those repetitive activities in a business that really is difficult uh, to, to manage, right? Um, people have different ways of doing it. You might have central filing, but people have files, folders, binders. Storing and searching these things is, is mostly a manual task. Unless the company has made an investment in imaging technology and document management. But if those documents aren't linked to your accounting records, you have another island, right? You may even have a bridge sort of there. I know QuickBooks, for example, allows you to link documents with customers and with vendors and specifically with invoices and payables. But it's an island that's actually all stored in, in one file and that document is linked to that customer or vendor for that event. I don't have a way of going in and searching on customer XYZ and seeing all the documents, all the contracts, all the agreements, all the notices, all the incoming correspondence in one place. And then when we are talking about documents, we're talking about who has access to it generally and who has a need to know, right? I, I, for example, a company's financial statements is need to know. So at the end of the day, we need to recognize that, uh, that when we're accessing that data, that the owners are responsible for making sure that they have identified general access need to know and have mechanisms for quickly and easily storing and retrieving documents. How that works in your organization today is probably a separate, distinct, highly manual process. Uh, you probably have a mixture of PDFs and images sitting out there on hard drives. It might be up on a server. You might be using a SharePoint or a similar management tool. Um, you might be having uh, have in place something that your copier company provided you with, but it's not linked 
to a more robust set of information about the people, the relationships that you have. And so what happens is document processing, which really does drive a lot of businesses, uh, takes up a lot of physical space. Uh, that real estate is incredibly valuable. And it adds to the overall workflow flow of, of what's going on in the system, right? So there's a lot of manual maintenance of document management systems. These are just a few of the things that I wanted to talk about in this first presentation to kind of get some thoughts out there in, in terms of a groundwork or ground framework uh, and build a conversation over the coming months of the year where we can address these pain points, whether it's document management or it's human resources and workforce recruitment, data security, or overall just bringing some alignment and some order to our, to our company through integration, which in the end provides greater resilience to your business. And for example, in, in integrating documents, a lower expense where we become more uh, librarians of information in our organization, as opposed to authors and recreating stuff and rewriting stuff and cutting and pasting stuff. Efficiency, uh, again, efficiency to uh, easily load and find information in our system without worrying about it being inaccurate, like our accounting database, separate from our um, customer relationship database. That should all be one. And ultimately, this results in a repetitive activity being saved. If I, if I, can, if I can take a manual step that I'm doing regularly out of a company's process, and automate that, for example, eliminating the need to maintain two databases and just maintaining one. That repetitive savings will drop every single time to the bottom line. And that will ultimately, by, by reducing costs, and that will ultimately improve the profitability of the business. So one of the things I suggest is Googleizing your business. I, I like looking at the document management handling because for whatever reason, that seems to be the great divider and unifier across most companies. And uh, whether it's from sales to the accounting folks, or it's purchasing an inventory control to the accounting folks, or uh, accounting information, letting salespeople know that this company is in trouble and needs a little bit more handholding, get closer to them. You know, make sure that they're making their payments, or see, make sure that they're still open. That's a big issue these days. Um, all of that allows a company to more effectively communicate with each other. So that's uh, that's kind of the overview uh, for this this session. Are there any questions or observations people would like to make? Oh, thanks for the encouragement, Jamie. I see what you put in the chat. That's great. Oh, definitely. Yeah, no, uh, you and I are definitely very in line, I think, in, in how we how we think about these these issues. Um, so instead of kind of reaching out to broader subjects, I know you got a whole series coming up on different topics, maybe focusing on your presentation today. One thing I'm kind of curious is how you handle when you specifically talk about documents um like a version control so i'm thinking about it from like a coding perspective when like you know you have a, a github or something like that and obviously ultimately you get to that search where it's real easy for your for your owners to to search and, and, and find things um but but uh yeah just specifically on the documents and the version control and as far as once something's in there not not losing it and having to pay that 250 dollars. i wonder if you could uh expand on that a little bit yeah, I think that's a great point. Version control is also one of those processes that seems to be very manually driven, even though it's automated, right? They, 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 somebody somewhere has to say, like you said, GitHub, where I'm going to release something to my library. Somebody has to say, okay, this is going to be our standard nomenclature for identifying a new unique product. Or is this just a variation of an existing product, right, or, or asset? And so all of that with more sophisticated library management tools, document management or otherwise, is automated. Uh, but if you don't know how to set it up and you haven't thought about some of these things, what you'll end up doing is automating what you've already been done doing manually. 
And that's the jeopardy companies put themselves in when they begin to not, when they begin to implement a solution, which is intended to automate what they have been doing manually for a long time. I guess that's the best way to say it, right? That's the jeopardy. Because if, if my process manually was tough, how am I going to ever streamline it if all I'm doing is automating that, right? I need to think out of the box. And that's why it's important for people to realize that there's a difference between me as a transactional individual, a gatherer, and somebody else in the organization as the owner, the point responsible for efficiently saying, this is how I want to use the, the information. So a version control is important in your industry and it's not important in a lot of industries but it is important for example in food and medical and other kinds of things software and ip right those are very very important areas where that should really be a primary strategic concern for the data owner unfortunately what we find even in mid-sized companies is that a lot of data gatherers have a lot of influence on data owners and they resist change. So streamlining is not what their objective is. It's minimizing change. And, and so once we've defined who are the data owners, it's very clearly said, you have the fixed responsibility for HR and HR is gonna be responsible for applicant tracking all the way through Exits and terminations, everything, will to tool, right? Same thing in accounting. They, you know, the accounting is one of those things that's it's very, you used the term earlier, right? Siloed, right? We have people who are in the subsidiary journals, but ultimately, whoever's preparing those financial statements in conjunction with your outside accountants need to be responsible for saying, this is what we must have. They're the ones that evaluate financial processes, ensure a two-person rule on cash handling, and make sure that the documents are properly T'd and I'd, right? T's crossed, I's dotted. And when that happens, then it's amazing how the processes are no longer being invented on the fly. There's actually standards. And when you can establish standard processes and work with the people to adopt those, and that takes time, the results will flow from that financially. If, if you're putting in a system in order to save money, that is absolutely the wrong approach. That's a salesman's approach to getting you to write a check. The goal here is to streamline, improve through automation, invest in the education and training of your people because they are either data owners or data gatherers and make sure they can do that well and, and stay in the wheelhouse. Right. We want we don't want to make more work for people and integration by definition should actually make less work for people. We're going to explore those in the, in the subsequent months. I, I don't know if once a month is, is going to be too often or, or not enough, but uh, whether we're talking sales process, we're talking about time and attendance through payroll and job costing. We have a, a variety of topics that I think might tickle the interest of pretty much everybody who's out there at some point. And uh, one of the areas why I emphasized HR today a little bit is because of all of the changes HR has gone through in the last year. I, I know of no department in an organization that has undergone more challenges with COVID-19 than the HR departments. Whether it's in, in layoffs or furloughs, dealing with benefits, um, handling unemployment, uh, working from home issues, remote management, how do we handle this? And then, of course, recruiting. Where do you recruit? How do you recruit? So automation is hitting the HR industry pretty hard right now. And a lot of people are playing catch up. Jackie, do you have anything? Oh, okay. Good lunchtime, right? <laughs> and how about uh, Vinicius? Vinicius, are you in Brazil?
I don't know if he can respond. Oh, very good. Oh, he's in the Netherlands. Netherlands. Wow. wow, very good. Thank you very much for attending. Okay, I thought your email address was Brazil. Okay, very good. Well, thanks for connecting onto our servers. So this is pretty good. I think we had a nice whole group here today and I appreciate it if you liked it. Um, say something on social media. We'll obviously publish the presentation with a few edits on it. And if you'd like the, the deck, I can email that to you as well as follow up. Dr. Hill, I really appreciate your time. I think the, the whole series is a, is a great idea. So yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll definitely share it with my network and uh, uh, draw people more in for next time. Cause I think this, is, uh, this is a great conversation. I promise not a sales pitch, right? It's not a sales pitch. I'm, I'm, I'm much too old to worry about sales right now. <laughs> I just want to get a legacy out there of people who understand the value of integrating systems and how important it is today because the change is coming. And you can either embrace it or you can go kicking and screaming. I like the idea of all arm and arm on a yellow brick road. So that's the way it is. So, all right. Thank you very much. Drop me an email if you'd like, um, and we'll see you on social media. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much, Jackie. Good to see you. Bye-bye, Jamie. Okay. Bye-bye, Vinicius.